Uh, but as the more I did my research, I saw that they actually offer, at the University of Nations, they offer a degree in music. So I was thinking, this is a great opportunity for me to do God's work as well as get my degree in music. So I prayed about it, I told my parents about it, and they, they were keen, um, they were supportive of what um, I decided I would like to do, but now it was up to God to just let everything happen. So I applied in like a few days before um, the school started. I got an acceptance letter, which made me stress because it was like two or three days before I had to leave. So I didn't even know if I was going. So I got there and I was with Huawei Musenberg. So the first three months was basically training on how to be a missionary. But for the, first, uh, the first half of the, the school is them teaching you how God is a personal God. <coughs> so uh, they taught us things on how to hear God's voice mm -hmm. and how to, um, to receive grace from God because sometimes we we push ourselves away from God because we don't believe that we deserve that grace. So there was grace and there was the nature and character of God, which showed us publicly how God just stays the same throughout the Bible. Glory. How He does not change. And these were all mind-blowing and because I, I thought, you know, um, I was quite naive and I thought I knew everything about the Bible, but I really did not. And God really taught me some new things um, that He wanted me to know. And the second half was then us learning about missionaries, um, evangelism, prayer, all these important things that have to go, um, that goes into being a missionary, right? So they give us the the locations Thailand and Cambodia. So both of these countries are in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are not very. They are both third world countries. Um, yeah. So that was the team that we were paired up with. Uh, we are very international. Uh, we have four South Africans in there, three Canadians. Uh, German, Australian, and a Zimbabwean. So uh, the Zimbabwean on the corner, he was our leader for this. So he was the oldest. We were all teenagers. All of us were between the ages of 18 and 25. And then he was 32. So he was leading us on this mission. But he himself was also a student. So he was learning with us in this. So, our first location was Mayai in Thailand, which is in a province called Chiang Mai. So, this is, as you can see, it's up there, north of Thailand, and it's on the borders of Myanmar and Laos. So, they, those countries are in extreme poverty at the moment. They are very close countries, Myanmar and Laos. So the people flee into Thailand. So at the borders of these countries are illegal immigrants and they have children and their children is born in Thailand but they are born without citizenship. So they cannot go to school, they cannot go into the city to, to learn anything or buy anything for themselves. So they live in these, um, in the forest basically we had to drive uh, very, very high up into the mountains to get to these unreached people. So um, we went up basically, we went up and we went to go teach them English, we taught them Bible stories, we are very bad at acting but as a team we just went for it because <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, as you can see there, there's a lot of children, small children. Uh, we have the teenagers as well. The teenagers, they could speak 
English very well because we worked with a ministry called the Tea of Life Ministries. And these are a group of Brazilians that God called to go work in Thailand. So they gave up everything that they had in Brazil. And they packed it up, moved to Thailand to start the Tea of Life Ministries. And God led them to these people. God led them straight to these people. And God said, I want you to work with them. Mm. Uh, so these are the unreached people um, of Thailand. And there are many more villages like this, many more, but we only got to work with a few, and as you can see there. So our purpose was basically to not only teach the children English and the Bible, but also to build relationship with them, to play with them, just to be someone they can talk to or <coughs> hug or anything of that nature, just so that they can feel loved, and included and special because this is this is this is uh, what God wants. He wants us to love our neighbor. So this was us loving our little neighbors. Um, yeah, some of these are uh, some of the kids. They weren't very responsive because we were foreigners and they they did not want to come close to us. And some of the kids, as you can see in the the top two corners. Uh, the two teenagers, they were very open. They took us all around the village and they just wanted us, they just wanted to show us where they lived, which was a beautiful, beautiful place. So, uh, so basically, uh, in this first location that we were at in Mayai, uh, we encountered some, so in the first location, the house where we lived had a spirit house. So, a spirit house is a little, it's very beautiful, but it's a little house in the front yard uh, where the Buddhists claim the spirits live. So they have these spirit houses and then they feed the spirit house and they give it water and cold drink and rice and things like that because they believe if you don't feed the spirits, the spirits will attack you and come after you. So, the first two weeks when we were in this location, our house had a spirit house. And the only reason why it was still there is because the missionaries that lived there, or the, the owner of the house was living next door. So, we could not take it down, or they could not take it down because they were renting the place. So, basically, there was a spirit house, the neighbor was feeding the spirits in the spirit house. So we, in the house, we were constantly praying against this. It was so difficult because we didn't, we couldn't pray as well as we could when we were in South Africa. Because the atmosphere is so different. The spiritual atmosphere is completely different. You can feel it when you walk into the country. It is just different. So we had to constantly pray against these things and it, it was new for us because we always felt that it was easy for us to pray and for us to feel the Holy Spirit and but this time we just had to do warfare all the time just to feel that okay now we can actually go and we can have our Bible study in peace because there's so many things that hinder you so many thoughts and you're just thinking where is this coming from but there are so many things that especially in this place came to play where we just constantly had to stay in prayer more than anything else so the next location that we went to was about 12 hours from where we were and i don't think you can see it but that this place is called mahasaraka so in this place, we did mainly village visits of um, people who were Christian in the, in the village. So they all stuck together because it's a very small amount of people that are Christians. And the people are mainly, um, there's missionaries here. The, in the corner, you can see a mother and her daughter. I love them so much. <laughs> um, 
but her husband is not a Christian. So they have this group of women who get together a few times a week because they pray for their husbands who not who have not brought themselves to Christ. So uh, we were working with them. We were encouraging them a lot in these times because they felt very discouraged because their husbands were basically disowning them because they were Christian. So uh, we went and we played with the kids. They also have their own kids, so we played with them. Uh, this was during the time of the Buddhist New Year called Songkran. So what happens is they throw water on you, ice water, and it's very hot, so it was nice. Um, and they, they bless you, they give you a blessing. So we played with the kids uh, with water balloons and things like that and just made it fun for them. And for the older people, we went in and told them our testimonies and about how good God is and just gave them that encouragement. We also worked with students, as you can see in the bottom corner over there. We worked with university students who, who were very intelligent. So they have a lot of questions about God and about Jesus. And they are very rooted in their faith as Buddhists. So when you come to them with new information about another religion or another God, mm -hmm. then they will ask you so many questions. So we had to be prepared here, um, publicly, as well as in apologetics, things like that. We had to know um, answers to questions, and if we didn't, we just pray that God just gives us the answer. Um, which happened a lot. God really spoke to us in this time. Um, and we were living with a pastor and his wife, as you can see in the top corner over there. Uh, the, this pastor is one of the most humble pastors I've ever met. He doesn't speak much, uh, but one of the only things that he asked of us was to help him in the rice fields. And he there was this huge piece of land that he got with the church that he was preparing by himself to plant rice for the rainy season so that he could sell it and then help the people in the community with the money that he gets from selling the rice. So he was basically doing this rice field on his own. He was with the spit thing and he was just going at it. And uh, we helped him out a bit and we saw the labor that goes into that. It is not easy working in a rice field because at the end of the day, your fingers are all, or your hands are all cut up and blistered. And he was doing this all on his own. While his, his wife was out working with the women who, who have been rejected by their husbands because of their faith, and their daughter that was teaching English to little children, um, also teaching the students at the uni universities the Bible. So this was Mahasarakam. We worked with uh, Filipino uh, missionaries. They moved over to Thailand and they worked here. We also met the richest man in Mahasarakam. And this is their house in the middle. Um, yes, he is not Christian, but we had the opportunity to, to minister to him and to tell him about Jesus. He opened up his house to us. He has a very big house with you can see that he is the richest man in Mahasarakam. He owns a, a, a motorbike company. And in Asia, motorbikes are what everyone drives. People very rarely drive cars. So he makes a lot of money with the sales that he has with the motorbikes. So we, he was very gracious enough to open up his home for us. And we spoke to him about Jesus. Even though he did not accept Jesus then and there, he still said that he would think about it and he would, I don't know, pray about it. <laughs> um, so that was Mahasaraka. We then went to Cambodia, which was one of the most difficult locations we went to. Um, 
We were in a, a village that I couldn't find on a map. It's called Puk. And it is so remote. Uh, someone told someone in the village told us that we were one of the first foreigners in the village to come preach there. Um, yeah. So uh, there is a girl I work with. Her name is Saren. And she's the only Christian in the nearby village that she's at. Mm. So she worked with us. And then we had Sam, and he was also rejected by his family. So he was living on the school that we were at. He was rejected for being a Christian. He was called ugly. He was just completely um, rejected by his family because of his faith. But he continued to teach English and to teach um, the Word of God to the children in the um, surrounding villages. So we, we worked uh, with, we had two villages a week that we went to. We called them the Thursday and the Friday village. And we just did Bible stories with them. We played games with them. We told them about Jesus. They didn't know who Jesus was. Um, we told them about him. We read them stories. We were doing the dramas again, which was... Um, <laughs> we, we aren't very good at acting, as I said before. So it was a challenge for us. We also became permanent teachers. So every day for an hour, we had a class and we taught English, which was part of the national curriculum of Cambodia. So we had to teach from these books. In the bottom corner, I had six or seven students. Um, they were all quite good in English. Uh, so we communicated very well. I also had a student in my class that was 20, 20 years old with Down syndrome. So that was a bit of a challenge, but with God, it worked out very well. Awesome. Praise um, God. Yes, God really worked in these classes, even though we were not allowed to preach in the school because of the curriculum. But sometimes we just snuck in a prayer or two just to hear. Yeah. Um, we played games. Uh, there was a village where the kids threw ants on us all the time, and it's those big ants. So uh, we had to work with these kids <laughs> for a month, and they would just throw bugs on us all the time, but we would still have to go and preach to these people, even though we were getting bitten by the animals around us. We had to, for the, for the, for the gospel, anything for the gospel. So, yeah, we also went out on village visits to the people who lived there just to experience what they are like. And they are very nice people. They opened their homes up to us, gave us their best foods, gave us their best teas and drinks and things like that. Um, they did not want prayer. They did not want us to speak about Jesus. So all we had... To, to go in was the fact that we had to love people as Jesus loved us without mentioning his name, without mentioning um, why we are actually there. They knew, but they did not want to know about it. So we had to pray and say, Lord, how do we love people in the best way possible without mentioning you or the Bible or anything like that? Because the man of the house, he can get very strict. And so Cambodia was one of the heaviest, heaviest places to go to, spiritually. Because at four in the morning, um, the, the monks in our village, I don't know how big their speakers were, but they had huge speakers and they would chant at four in the morning, every morning for three hours. They would chant whatever they are chanting, and we would wake up just thinking, oh my goodness, what is this? The first morning, we was in shock. We were, we were thinking, why at, at such an early hour? But 
these are the the things that they do there to keep them um, safe from the spirits. They are very fearful of the spirits. They have a relationship with the spirits, uh, like a friendship, like we have with Jesus. But they are very fearful of them, so they do whatever they need to in order to stay in the spirits' good books. And this also meant chanting. Um, they had the chanting in the morning, and then sometimes they would have these weird chants in the afternoon or in the evening, but it would go until late at night and early in the morning. So we also had to pray a lot because those demonic things were just coming for us the whole time. We had an instance where in the middle of the night, uh, one of my fellow missionaries uh, and I, we woke up in the middle of the night just in angst because we had to, we just felt something in the room move. So, the, uh, the reason for this is because a few years, uh, 30, 40 years ago, Cambodia was a country that was in genocide. So, people were being killed for being young, for being intelligent, so that they cannot take over the land. So, a lot of people were killed. There are monuments in Cambodia where the skulls just, um, are hung on a pole, the skull of every person. And we were basically surrounded by a burial ground where these people were. They were just killed and slaughtered and placed right there. So all of Cambodia was, was a slaughter place. And so their currency is very, very weak because of this. A hundred real, which is their currency, um, is four South African cents, sure. four cents. So their country is in recovery because of the genocide that happened. Mm. And it all started because they felt that their, their country wasn't good enough and that they were being taken over by the intellectuals and they felt that um, the people who couldn't read or write, they felt that they were being discriminated against. So they were all, the educated people were all killed. So there's a percentage of Cambodians that's only young people. Mm. I think it's about 30%, um, 35% of Cambodians that is only young people that is under the age of 40. So it was, that this country has a great, great history and it's, it's something you can feel in the air. You can feel the spiritual tension of it. Um, and we would go into the villages and pray, and these things would just, these spiritual things would just come at us. We, we would feel it. People would want to start throwing up, and it would just be this manifestation of, of what is already there, and we just had to do warfare all the time. Um, and these spirits were trying to take away our faith because um, it was strange, but when we were in Thailand, everyone felt that the, their faith was still intact. But then when we were in Cambodia, people started questioning things like the resurrection and why would God even die on the cross for us? All these questions arose when we knew the answers, but it was like, these thoughts just came to us and we questioned so much. We went through a phase as a team where we just questioned everything. And we didn't know why because we knew the truth. We know that we knew the truth. So we had a lot of these attacks which was a lot stronger than in Thailand. So we went back to Thailand after that. Um, to a town called Ratchaburi, and it is close to the beach. It was an hour away from the beach and three hours away from the main city, Bangkok. So um, in this time, we felt a refreshment, just going from Cambodia into Thailand. The moment we walked through the border, we could feel the atmosphere change, because everything changed. Spiritually, things changed. So, we walked in and it was this refreshment, God just refreshed us 
and we were on fire again. We knew what we knew. We were, we were um, cemented in our faith again. And then we went out and we did so many ministries here. So we worked in schools where we also taught them English and we taught Bible stories, did dramas. Uh, we sang songs like making melodies in my heart. We sang that with them and they thought we were weird, but uh, it worked because everyone was dancing in the end. <laughs> so as you can see, there's kids in the corner, those two corners, those are the schools we were, we were at. And so we got invited by a Brazilian in, in Ratchaburi to come and have Bible study at his house one, one night. So we went over, it's a really nice house, and we just had Bible study like normal. And the next day, two days later, we found out that he was a really famous football player in Thailand and he bought us all tickets to go see a rugby, uh, sorry, a soccer match in Ratchaburi. And we didn't know that this guy was this popular because when we were at the soccer match, people were coming up to him asking him to sign his shirt and we were just like, but we just had Bible study with, the, with him. We didn't know he was this famous. So God opened up doors in that aspect for us where we could meet people not only in the villages but also on the other side where um, this small group of Brazilians, the only ones um, in Ratchaburi that they know of, where they got together and they praised God in Portuguese. And it was so refreshing for them to meet new Brazilians because our team had a few Brazilians in them, um, in, in the team. So we then did uh, we went to a Catholic school in the corner and that was about 800 kids that 10 people had to work with. So we had to split it up into groups where we didn't exactly know what to do with such a big amount of kids. So we just danced with them, we did a drama with them, uh, we did some actions with them. And they really liked it. They were very interactive. They could speak English. So one of the teachers at the school was, is a South African. So I could talk to her in Afrikaans um, about uh, the school and, and the religious side of everything. And this is one of the biggest uh, Catholic Christian schools in Ratchaburi sorry, at the moment. So then we also went to a juvenile detention center for girls between the ages uh, 13 and 23. Um, these kids are um, convicted of things like prostitution, uh, drugs, things like that, and they were completely exiled from their homes. Um, their families disowned them, everyone disowned them. So they are just in this juvenile detention, detention center. No one is visiting them. It's, they only know the gods and the people around them. So we went in and we just had fun. We sang songs with them and we just listened to their stories. And we realized that sometimes people just need someone that they can listen to, that would listen to them. Um, yeah, they had no one and they were so excited to see new faces and new people. Um, so they were even crying when we gave them hugs. Um, yeah, so they, they are rejected a lot, a lot for what they did and they feel rejected as well. And there's just an atmosphere in this, um, in the juvie itself is just a feeling of rejection and you don't they didn't feel like they were worth anything mm. so um, we could speak about God here and we just told them about their worth and about 
how God sees them and mm -hmm. um, viewing themselves yeah. through through God's eyes, yeah. through Christ's eyes. Yes. And they have a saying in Thailand, um, to be Thai is to be Buddhist. So they won't necessarily believe unless the Holy Spirit touches them. Mm. So uh, we can't just go out and speak, we had to pray. Yeah. We had to pray all the time. And uh, the reason why we did this, all of this, the, the missionary work that we did, is basically based on Mark 16 verse 15, which says, And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Amen. Amen. So this, is, this was the main purpose of what we did. And one of the biggest things that, that stood out to me when I asked God, Lord, why are people missionaries? Why do people stay long term when they can just be in evangelical? Um, but God reminded me that relationships in Christianity is so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, being friends with these people, asking them, are you okay? Did you drink a glass of water today? Did, do you need a hug? Things like that. These people don't hear that. And because the Thai culture is so built on shame, when you do something wrong, they reject you. Mm -hmm. So we had to go in and say, the things that you did wrong, God is there. God is there to take the, the sin away. And they would feel so bad for the things they've done because the, their fathers especially would just push them aside and say, you are not my son anymore or you are not my daughter anymore. So God just reminded us in Matthew, Jesus also said, the two commandments that he highlighted was love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The, that is the first and great commandment. Yes. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. So I asked myself, what does it look like to love God first and foremost with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. And it's basically what you feel for people, mm. the love you have for people and for God. The love you have for God is a reflection of how you're gonna interact with Amen. people. And it doesn't sound very direct, but if you think about it, it is so, because you are constantly in communication with God. And you ask God, Lord, give me your heart for the people. Because you have to pray that prayer. Because you don't know these people when you go into the ministry or into the missions. Um, if you don't feel like you have a passion for it, you can ask God, Lord, give me a heart for the people. And when you ask Jesus that, <laughs> he just, he gives you this empathy for people for what they are going through, for, for their circumstances, for everything. And then you ask yourself, so these, this is what the, the two greatest commandments look like. The Ten Commandments fall under these two big ones. Love God, love the person next to you. And in all of that, God moves. When you love God, it is your top line relationship with God where you are constantly in communication with God. And when you love your neighbor, you're still in that communication with God, but you're also in communication with the person in front of you, next to you. So it's so important to God that we establish relationships. It's not always about proving people wrong especially those who don't believe what we believe. It's not always about that. We don't have to go out there and wreck our brains to prove people wrong. We just have to go out there, show people the love that God has showed us as, as much as we can. And then God will do the rest. 
because we don't do these things on our own. If we do these things on our own, it's not going to work out as we plan. And the things that we deem fit to save souls is not what God sees. Because God is a personal God. And we see what's on the outside, but like with David, God sees what's in the air. So we don't know how to um, straight on to speak to people about Jesus, but he knows. That's why it's so important for us to be an instrument. It's so important for us to be an instrument instead of wanting to do what our own will is. Because Jesus knows best. That's it. All we have to do is worship Him, pray and trust Him. That's, we just have to give over to God. And that is what we do from our side. He will do the rest. All the spiritual stuff and the logistics, all of that is in God's hands. We, our, flight, our fight is not against flesh and blood. So we don't have to go in in these situations and speak to the person. We have to go into these situations and say, Lord, what do you want me to say? Where do you want me to be? What is my role in this? And it is difficult sometimes because people reject you. They push you away because this is not what they believe. But God works through all circumstances, all situations. And the Bible said, says that no word returns for you. And that is one of the things I had to keep with me on this mission trip. Because there were times where I would, we would go out and we would speak to people and it was like their faces were blank. It was like we did not get through to them at all. But we had to remind ourselves that no word returns void. No matter how their faces look, a lot along the line somewhere they will be reminded of it that seed is already planted yes, you they just had to hear it they just had to hear the word of god god will do the rest Amen. and we don't know what's going on in the spiritual but or on the inside of that person but we do know that god is working Glory to god. Glory. we do know that god is working yes. and i was reminded this morning of um, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 4 um, where uh, Paul says rather as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way um, in great endurance in troubles hardships and distresses in beatings imprisonments riots in hard work sleepless nights hunger, impurity, understanding, patience, in the Holy Spirit, and insincere love. We have to keep going. We have to keep going. We have to keep working for Christ. And it is very difficult because they, you go through a lot of rejections, not only from the people you're with, but also the people outside. Um, yeah, and being a missionary is not just uh, going to another country and staying there. Or it is, but be doing God's work is basically talking to your neighbor. Neighbor, loving, loving your neighbor is just telling them about Jesus, telling them about the love of Jesus. Telling them what you know about Jesus. Be, be eager to answer when people ask about your faith. Um, don't push people away. It's, it's so easy to push people away who, who we've seen have sinned or have done things that we just cannot. But God, God doesn't even push those people away. 
that is just us. So we, no matter how we feel about what someone has done, we still have to go out and tell them about Jesus. And like with the Buddhists, they don't believe in Jesus. They, they push us away. They are very nice, but they don't want to hear about Jesus. But we still, we go out and we tell people about Jesus because Jesus is the truth. Oh, yes. If you know the truth, why do you want to keep it to yourself? That's one of the biggest things is you have the truth, you have the Bible, and you have the Holy Spirit with you. You go out and you preach the gospel. And whether going out is just going outside of the church, outside of the town, out the country, Go out and preach the gospel to all creation. Amen. Thank you so much. Come on, Alex. Come on, I'm 20 years old. 20. 4 times 5. 20. <laughs> <laughs> Alle jonge mensen, die van jullie stemmen belangen, we zijn er weer samen met de gaan te gaan doen. Ah, nee, ik heb het zo gedankt. Ah, het is mens, dat is niet zo. Alright, geliefdes, daar is alleen die kwee om vrouw, vrouw te gaan vrouw. Is daar enige iemand wat vrouw een vrouw heeft? It's now the opportunity of all of hold your peace. He can for free, full free of water from. She is more as bright and able to give you an answer. He can with the Afrikaans speak as any English can speak. He will. That is not an issue for her. He can with the Afrikaans speak. Is there anyone with a question? Is there anyone? Thank you, Pastor. that come with that and one of the big emotions that surprisingly that come in is pride because now you go in with the thought that these people need me these people need to know and you almost put yourself on that pedestal and it's so easy to, to get to that point but God constantly had to humble me all the time all the time all the time and I'm very grateful for that. And um, after a while, when you are in that place where you just uh, humbled by everything, then you see these people, and it is you do feel rejected after a while, and you do feel like the people are staring at you. Um, 
and the people they do ask a lot of questions that really kind of hurt uh, but it's part of their culture and their culture is completely different to ours so we had to keep in mind that uh, culturally it is going to be different whether we like it or not it's all about adjusting and it was difficult in the beginning but after a while we see that these are also only just people that believe different things uh, we are all people so uh, it's easy both on both sides of the spectrum I've experienced those emotions um, and it is a roller coaster personally because uh, they because you are foreign they expect more of you and they are disappointed when they don't get exactly what they expected uh, but on the bright side people are very welcoming their, their arms are always open to receive people to give their last if they need to but yeah I, I have a question for you, Melanie. Um, were you afraid was there at any stage, although for the first time uh, for visionary work I went to Thailand, uh, Cambodia, um, were you at any stage uh, afraid, you feel some fear inside you, going inside you, uh, going for the first time. Uh, yeah, was there any fear inside you? Did you feel uh, that uh, you are, uh, how, shall I, how shall I say it, um, you were pressed into a tin um, that you can't breathe uh, freely? Uh, what, was, what, was, what was your feeling at that time? So before we went, I felt very inadequate and I felt that I was not good enough uh, to, to speak about it. I didn't feel like I was completely ready to go out and preach to people. Uh, and this was my biggest fear, that I would somehow mess up what I'm doing. And oh, messing up is, is it's, it's, something that can affect years of work in, in a missionary's life. So I was very afraid of messing up. Um, I felt that I personally wasn't on a spiritual level enough to go out and preach to the people before I went. And when I got there, there were a lot of cultural restrictions as well. Like we could not wear skirts, uh, above the knee, we couldn't wear uh, things that were shorter than a, a t-shirt and it was more than 40 degrees every single day. You wake up at 7 in the morning and then it's already 38 degrees. So there was all these things, discomfort and it is, it is not all roses and sunshine. There is a lot of discomfort that goes with it. But um, I'm very grateful to my parents for raising me in uh, a very diverse way. So I've experienced a lot of things in my lifetime because they've exposed me to a lot of things. So um, I could adjust very easily. Uh, but my team, some of my team members could not. They just could not adjust. And this caused a lot of tension between us because they were always complaining, the food is this, the heat is this, and um, they also had their own personal insecurities when it came to, when it came to this, to the missionaries. Uh, but fear was a big thing. Uh, on a personal level but when we thought when we were reminded of God being in charge and in control uh, that went away as long as we were focused then on God and not so much ourselves the it it became easier that's true
Two questions. How long was your missionary work? Uh, so we were there for about three months, uh, one and a half in Thailand and one and a half or one month in Cambodia, so two and a half months more or less. And yes, I would go back. Um, besides all the, the heat and all of those things, the people that I met there, they, they are so nice. And it's so easy to build relationships with them because they are open to knowing about um, Jesus and about you and about your country and about where you come from and the people. Um, it's just non-stop conversation. And not only for the non-Christians, but also the people that we lived with. They were amazing people. They went out of their way to accommodate us. And I, I was so grateful for them because uh, one of the girls that stayed on the school, she's the only Christian in her village. And she at the school, she, she, she was 20 years old. She was my age. And she was cooking for like a lot of people and she never cooked before because uh, her parents passed away and she lived at the school where they cooked for her. But things came to the point where she was the one who had to cook. And she was just so nervous and so scared that she would be judged. But the people there, she, they are amazing. And it made things a lot easier to, to do when we had them by our side. So I would definitely, yes, definitely, definitely go back. It seems to me that you are, are enjoying the work of the Lord. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, congratulations and all the best of luck to you when you go back. Is there any more questions from you, from your side? You know, a frog on your counter? Now, sir, you don't come up for a year, frog, frog. And I don't know if you can come back to the hand, it's just something to believe in. As you look at the book of Jeremiah, Dat Jeremia van die Heere sê, ek is te jong, ek is nog jong. Die Heere sê, my moenie vir my sê, jy is jong. Gaan waar jy met jou stier. En ek sal met jou wees. Jong. Jy sê, ek denk dat sê, sê is nog kind. Amen. Dat is het nie waar nie. Maar kyk die vuilwe van God op haar leven. En die wonskracht wat sê het om vir die Heere te gaan werk. Om die naam van die Heere te gaan uitdraag. Kom ons geef vir haar nog aan. Hi, Dr. Melody. Very much appreciated. It was really, really very good to have you here. And I believe the congregation enjoyed your teaching, your speech this morning. And I believe you have planted a seed here this morning. Hallelujah. And... If there's anybody here, if there's anybody here, young or old, it doesn't really matter, who is also interested in uh, mission, uh, uh, missionary work, just ask me for Melody's number. <laughs> only her. Only you. <laughs> only me. Only me. Not the parents. No, you can ask me. Because, because I will be in contact with our parents and, and you can you can be in contact with me. Yes. Alright, joking. Um, you can be in contact with me uh, and Apostle Leon.